Very good evening to all our viewers and thank you so much for tuning in to We On World Is One News. I'm Shethi Narula and as always we bring you one particular sector that we dissect on this particular show which is a look ahead to the upcoming union budget. Now in the past 15 days the petrol and diesel prices have risen impacting the household budget for a large number of Indians. We pay high amounts for electricity as one supplied by power companies is ridden with faults and cuts and one ends up spending exorbitantly on generators and other backups. All this has a huge bearing on the Indian household budget. Is this because of the structural problems in the sector or factors that are beyond domestic control? This and more we will discuss with our experts, Mr. Rajiv Bell, who is the Director of Petroleum Federation of India, who joins us live in the Vion headquarter, and former Executive Director of Indian Oil, and Mr. Anil Razdan, who is the former Power Secretary as well. Now, the power and petroleum sector that impacts citizens and industries equally is seeking big incentives in the upcoming budget. While power industry needs incentives to bring tariffs down, Common public wants duties on petroleum products to come down for cheaper fuel. Our chief business correspondent, Sumit Chaturvedi, brings us the story. Take a look. Mr. Govind Hemrajani is a businessman and now, as the budget is just a week away, he is expecting a lot from this annual exercise. Mr. Hemrajani utilizes power both in his house and his industry and pays different tariffs for it. The biggest relief he wants is from the high power tariffs, though there is a backup available at home. Bills are going up every day due to constant cuts. Also, the high tariffs are making cost of living dear. But the problem is not just inside the house. They are finding difficulties outside the house as well. High fuel prices are worrying Mr. Hemrajani a lot. With the crude prices going up, petrol and diesel prices are likely to move further northwards in the coming few months. Govind Hemrajani wants government to bring down duties in the budget so that monthly fuel bills come down. See, approximately we have got an expenditure of 7 to 8,000 rupees on one car, right? Uh, the petrol expenses I'm talking about. And uh, as per our expectations, the rounds are taking place of excise being lowered. So whatever the excise that is levied on the crude or petrol, we expect approximately three to four or five rupees reduction just because of the excise, what the talks are being taking place uh, that we are hearing. The situation of power sector has improved in the last few years with the restructuring of power distribution companies or DISCOMs. But the overall power sector is still not out of the woods yet. Power sector wants inclusion of the sector in goods and services tax regime. It is also seeking better health of distribution companies and renegotiation of power purchase agreements. The sector has also proposed to extend the 10-year tax holiday to power generation companies by March 31, 2020. Power industry also wants to delink coal completely from the license raj and let it be subject to market signals and principles. Energy and commodity prices have remained subdued from the last two years, while consumers of the petroleum, gas and metals have been rejoicing this downturn since the last few years. The spike in crude and commodity prices is giving the users sleepless nights now. The oil and gas industry has made a slew of suggestions to the finance ministry. India's domestic production of natural gas is not enough to cater to the increasing demand and large-scale imports are required to augment the supply of natural gas for use in priority sectors such as fertilizers, CNG, LPG and PNG. Petroleum industry wants lower duty on transport of liquefied natural gas. Currently, service tax of 15% is applicable on LNG imports. With a view to boost the much-needed investments in the oil and gas sector, the industry has also demanded extending the tax holiday benefit from the existing 7 years to 15 years. The domestic industry also flags concerns about the implementation of BS6 emission norms by April 2020. The centre is preparing the union budget 2017-18, assuming an average crude oil price of $1.55 to $60 a barrel for the coming financial year. 
However, if prices hover above $1.60 a barrel for most of next year, the subsidy calculations and overall assumptions will be under strain. Sumit Chaturvedi, Beyond, New Delhi. Now, as the budget is uh, just a week away, uh, you know, we have to discuss the power sector now. I'm being joined in the studio by Mr. Rajiv Bell, the Director of Petroleum Federation of India and the former Executive Director of Indian Oil as well. Uh, Mr. Bell, thank you so much for coming uh, and joining us on the Union Budget Special. Now, when Narendra Modi came to power in India, the price of petrol in the national capital region was flirting around 55 rupees, and now that same price has gone to 72 rupees. Uh, this has tossed up the household budget for the common man as well. The input costs for several industries and has increased inflation as well. Now, is this due to the international commodity markets or the domestic stru structural problems that we're facing? Uh, well, this question has been asked several times, and uh, I've answered it many times. Uh, but let's understand it, uh, how, how it happens, you know. You know, the pricing of petroleum products is completely deregulated in India. Right. Now, when we say it is deregulated, it means the oil marketing companies have full freedom to fix the price of the products, you know. And that's what they do. Every fortnightly, we see the prices going up. And ever since you quoted number of 55, uh, when the Modi government came in, now it is close to 72. So there have been, during this period, one half year period, several revisions in the prices up, and up as well as down. Now, price variation in, in the Indian context is, is re, uh, resulting from two factors, basically. One, uh, the price of these products in the international market and the rupee-dollar exchange rate. Because that's what we sell. If the rupee goes the other way, then you pay for more. If the prices go, uh, international market go up, then you pay more. But the question that is, uh, is that whether uh, it is disturbing uh, the common man's budget or maybe uh, that, that's, that's very well understood because uh, a large part of it is uh, when you, at end price you calculate is by way of the local taxes for sure. which, both of which in a way the government is responsible. So uh, I heard one of your consumers saying that you know, it must go down by three or four rupees. I mean, I, I don't expect that to happen for three or four. But yes, there is definitely uh, uh, something is uh, which the government can do that if you want to bring down the prices. But you know, there, there was uh, when the uh, before the OPEC meeting, we saw before the output production cost happen and before crude oil even saw an uptick in pricing, the government of India really was capitalizing on the fact that crude oil is available at a very low price and the excise duty on that was very high. What is your sense of what they are going to be doing with the excise duty? Because at that point of time, I remember the exchequer has gained a lot by virtue of the excise duty being very high. Do you see a sort of compression that the government will bear in terms of its own earnings and bring the excise duty down so that the common man does not feel the pinch of rising oil prices? Well, uh, you're right in when you say that uh, the government of India, I mean, they did collect a lot of revenue by way of excise, you know, and which, which was in a way. But that was pro perhaps with an understanding that this money which the government is collecting, uh, which is not, uh, the consumers are not benefiting, will ultimately be spent for the benefit of the industry only. You know, so we, I view from that perspective, you know, if the end prices do not fall, or maybe uh, in line with, you know, international market prices and the government still, uh, in a way, you know, takes a, a large chunk by way of taxes. Sure. So that money should actually be, if the government is collecting, that should be given back to the industry in some form. The industry or the average man? Uh, do they? To average man, through the industry. Through know. the industry. Okay. Because this industry also needs uh, a lot of support, a lot of help from the government in terms of... Uh, you know, their financial positions in terms of uh, investments. Have they done it before? Are they likely to do it now? They, What's they, your sense? Uh, my sense is that uh, uh, it, may, uh, it may not happen uh, in that sense that uh, you may reduce the prices across the board straight away, you know, you know because they are market linked and uh, they, they have been going up, they're going down. And do not be just worried about uh, you know, their temporary, when if they're going up or going down. If it will take a longer perspective, I mean, you, the consumers in India pay what the market is, you know. Sure. Right. Now, the high crude oil prices are beneficial for the refining companies, we understand, but uh, definitely not for the consumers. The common man does not really like the fact that his petrol and diesel prices are higher. It's obviously impacting his wallet. There's always this catch-22 situation now. Uh, is there a way in which both the industry and also the end consumer 
can meet midway and have a win-win situation for both what is the solution to meet midway really well i think that we there, there's a third uh, party as well to it you said the refiners yes they, they refine the food and give the finished products to the consumers and uh, there are upstream companies as well you know sure. who are actually procuring or supplying this crude oil so whenever the prices go up uh, they in a way are i mean the, 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 the upstream companies a way to rejoice for them it's good for them upstream companies Sure. Refineries, of course, uh, you rightly said that uh, you know they they add, uh, tend to pay you know more for their imports. We still import a lot of crude oil, so uh, about about eighty percent we still import. So their working capital goes up. It's not a good sign for them. And and certainly we don't want to go back to the old regime where we had the uh, you know uh, a system of subsidies and all, where uh, the government had to dole out a lot of uh, subsidies to the oil marketing companies. So that will fortunately that will not be the case. Yes. Uh, you talked of a, some trade off for the midpoint where even the consumers can benefit yes i see there is a case you know if the worldwide prices go up or go down uh, the market should respect that and market should also share the benefits you know and the customers should also benefit that 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 that, that, that point is there you know. could you give us a sense on the projection projections rather of the prices of crude oil going forward what is your sense of uh what price it would be trading in internationally and how much it would uh, be trading in india well i will i, I cannot hazard a guess on oil prices have behaved uh, the way i mean no one can really give the projections but my sense is that uh, uh, i mean we, we don't see the three digit number 100 dollars is probably not the case i mean we, we don't see 100 dollars but yes current levels 60 70 those kind of levels are probably uh, there are there levels which are maybe e even the producers are comfortable the refiners are comfortable when it goes beyond that, you know, then probably it pinches everyone. Sure. So there's no certain uh, exact pricing at which you would peg your hopes on, uh, which is a plausible solution for the oil manufacturers and the end consumers as well. Uh, probably uh, the current levels, uh, if, they, if it sustains the current levels, probably that is a working, working, workable level for everyone, you know. And what is your expectation from the union budget for this particular sector if you were the finance minister perhaps oh. for one day? Hmm. What would you do really for this particular sector? Uh, well, uh, we, we, we submitted a lot of uh, wish lists to the government, you know, uh, when we were submitting our uh, pre-budget memorandum. And uh, I can count on maybe a couple of things which we, the industry really is looking at. You know, the number one was we were, the industry is really struggling, is to have the GST under the fold, uh, petroleum products under the fold of GST. Sure. You know, in the, if you recall, the last time we had the constitutional amendment, then, uh, you know, although petroleum products are in GST, but the timing thereof will be decided by the GST council. Sure. So unless that happens, uh, the, we are still out of it, you know. So the biggest demand that we put forward to the ministry was to take petroleum products and to GST from day one. So that was one, I think, one of the biggest uh, challenges which is the, even the government has. And my sense is that probably the, we have to bring the states on board. And then, then only it can happen because GST council has to decide. It's not the central government. Or somebody, no one can decide it alone. So our demand is that we should be uh, under GST from as soon as you know we would do it. So that's the biggest. That's, uh, that, that's the biggest uh, expectation. Uh, of course, uh, as we see that this will now slip to July. It is not uh, happening from first of April. But yes, July is not too far away. We yeah. There's a big, big change, you know. Right. And the second one, uh, I would, I would say that uh, there have been, uh, like, this is the sector which needs investments. Uh, and what my sense is that the, all the tax shops, which they were tax breaks were there, they would be gradually uh, phased out. Sure. So uh, the government must think in terms of uh, devising some either new schemes for uh, uh, to make uh, investments more attractive. Right. So, uh, because this ne this industry needs the investments, whether it's upstream or whether it's downstream, yeah. uh, we, we, we want that. And second thing is that uh, they should look at the ease of doing business, and that's very critical. Yeah. Uh, one example of ease of doing business that we also have put forward is uh, that uh, the service tax on royalty. Right. Now, so these are the three big takeaways, really. Uh, these are the three plus OED says there's another one we wanted right. to bring it down to from 20 percent to 8 percent. Sure. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now the current government has often talked about increasing the proportion of renewable energy in the Indian power sector. What measures have been taken by the government for both conventional and renewable energy? Our correspondent Shilpika brings you the story.
The Union Budget 2016 attempted to balance the shift towards renewable energy with the need to diversify the fuel basket. Though there were no big bang measures, focus was to achieve the energy security for the country. Major government proposals in Union Budget 2016 included increasing clean energy cess from rupees 200 per ton to rupees 400 per ton, introduction of calibrated market freedom for new discoveries and for areas yet to commence production, proposal of a comprehensive plan to augment investment in nuclear power. This is expected to span over a period of 15 to 20 years with a budgetary allocation of 30 billion rupees per annum. And finally, a scheme to provide LPG connections to 15 million households falling below poverty line and an allocation of 20 billion rupees is made for the same. Besides these proposals, the government worked on many policies throughout the year. National power tariff policy was amended in Jan 2016. to focus on electricity environment efficiency and ease the amendments were supposed to complement another policy called uday uday was launched in december 2015 to improve the financial health of distribution companies in the power segment in order to promote use of renewable energy solar renewable purchase obligations rpo is proposed to increase to 8% by 2022 even after all the measures underway There is a lot more to be done. Hydropower, which is economical in long run but has high upfront cost, need enhanced support. The coal mine auctions for power sector have not gained much traction after the first two rounds. The government needs to reconsider the auction mechanics to attract greater private sector interest going forward. Demand for service tax exemption on the exploration activities remain unfulfilled. So does the demand to broad base the existing customs duty exemption for explorations in production sector? In Union Budget 2017, the players in the sector are expecting government to take some actions in these directions. With Shilpika in New Delhi, this is Vrinda Agarwal, Vion. We also have Mr. Anil Rajdhan who is the former power secretary joining us live on Vion to discuss the power sector in much detail. Mr. Rajdhan, good evening and thank you so much for joining us right here on Vion. Now 70 years Mr Rajdhan since independence there are still Indeed. large sections of the society who do not receive electricity and the ones who do receive it it is marred by cuts and falls making them spend excessively on backups what are the problems that the sector is facing uh, if you could just highlight those so in terms of uh, capacity addition we have attained a very good targets and i think at the close of the 12th plan we would have attained 115% uh, virtually of the target this is after a long time now that over the last decade we've done very substantial capacity addition in fact the situation today is that the energy shortage and the peaking shortage as reported and monitored have come down substantially to very low figures of about 1% to 2%. Now, if this is the situation and we have connected almost all the villages and towns in the country with electricity, if people are still not getting electricity, it's a question of extension. Now, electricity is a concurrent subject falling within the purview of the central government as well as the state government. the distribution segment is entirely in the hands of the state governments the central government has very little to do with it except push across schemes for improving efficiency and trying to look at the uh, if uh, the financial viability of the distribution companies a lot of these distribution companies are having very high atnc losses that is aggregate technical and commercial losses and i would say that despite the best efforts of the government any distribution entity which is having more than 15 to 20% atnc losses is actually doing a huge disservice to the sector the uday scheme has brought down the debts of these distribution companies but it's been a transfer of debt or liability to the state governments and i think there has to be a limit to that because the state governments have other duties to perform they have to invest in social sectors also 
and the losses of the power sector should not keep burdening them. However, the government has done some relief to the financial institutions, essentially because they have something to hang on to to recover their uh, money, which they've given out to 70 to 80 percent of a project cost is from the financial institutions. But so far, we've been looking at supply side solutions only, and we have reached a situation when the plant load factor of our coal and lignite based plants has now fallen to between 55 to 60 percent. Now this is very unfortunate because normally you would expect these plants to run right. at about 80 to 85 percent PLF sure. if you are to get your maximum benefits right. of efficiency. So I would say that the time has now come to look at demand side management and increase somehow the demand for productive purposes like industry, manufacture, which should also give you more employment. That should, I think, be the focus of the government and be very clear to distribution companies that those who do not perform must perish. Sure. And now the current government, Mr. Razdan, uh, has uh, taken several measures to increase the capacity of renewable energy, but it still forms a minuscule part. Uh, what do you think is the reason for the same, Mr. Razdan? See, renewable capacity addition has come in very recently and essentially the factor is that you have to produce power which is affordable and viable. There's no point in producing power which nobody is going to purchase. At the moment about 4 rupees to 5 rupees tariff which is coming for solar PV is a very attractive tariff. But I think the time has come when we must start looking at another factor and that is about 80 to 85 percent of the solar PV units that we are installing are probably imported and mostly from China. So if we have to give impetus to renewable energy, I think we must pay attention to uh, incentivize domestic manufacturing activity so that Make in India is uh, incentivized and realized. And secondly, if you're pumping in so much of renewable energy into the system, which is intermittent and time of the day related, You've got to put balancing power in the nature of hydropower or gas-based power or battery storage. Now, if you see you are not putting this investment at the same time, you may run the risk of having a lot of stranded renewable power which may land in the system but cannot be absorbed. Sure. Uh, lastly, leave so us with I your closing comments, Mr. Razdan. What are your expectations? Demand. Mr. Ra Mr. Razdan, uh, uh, leave us with your closing comments on what your expectations are really from the upcoming union budget for this sector. I would say that uh, the coal prices should come down. And the fact that we have imposed an environment cess now earlier called the clean energy cess, we should deploy it for cleaning up the coal plants, essentially, and also for increasing efficiencies of the present system, and also probably for extending the surplus power that we have now for electric vehicles and for cooking, rather than bank on imported gas for cleaner kitchens. That is a high priority, but I think we should look at the option of electricity being supplied to these homes for cooking at low prices rather than bank entirely on cooking gas cylinders, which in any case is not the most efficient way of supplying gas. All right, thank you so much, uh, sir, for your comments. Freight also, now that the central government. All right, thank you so much, sir, for your comments. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have on this edition of the Union Budget Special. I'd like to thank both our panelists for joining us today and taking the time out. Mr. Rajiv Bell, who's the director of the Federation of Indian Petroleum Industry, and Mr. Anil Raznan, who's the power, former power secretary as well. Uh, thank you for tuning into the uh, uh, budget special. We will see you tomorrow.